Hey, hey, it's Patrick Coyle, artist in progress, and I suck at talking shop with other creators. I really don't do it enough. So today, I'm talking to writer-artist Bernie Gonzalez, creator of Midnight Mystery, about changing his life path from law enforcement to self-publisher, finding his artistic influences, and being a pragmatic storyteller. Let's go! Today's conversation is part one of three. Bernie and I had such a great time talking that it went on for way too long to share in just one video. Our conversation went on for over three hours. It was like the godfather of indie comics interviews, but without, you know, the Oscar winning actors, a visionary director, and all the bloodshed. But maybe this interview ends with Bernie getting shot at a toll booth by 20 Tommy guns. You don't know. Before we get into it with Bernie, if you enjoy this video or any of my other videos, please hit the subscribe button and click that bell so you'll be notified when my new videos go live. Now here's part one of our conversation. Uh, Bernie Gonzalez, welcome to Patrick Sucks at Drawing. Hey Patrick, how's it going? It's going well. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks um, for the invite. So I love Midnight Mystery. Um, for those of you at home, I've got a copy here. of This is volume two. That's volume three behind me. Uh, they're all available in your store right now. Um, volume one, two, and three. And they're Sorry. all fantastic. I love them. Um, and, but this is our first conversation. So I'd like to hear a little bit about your background. Um, did you go to art school or have any formal training in comics? Nothing formal. I was always that kid in high school that everyone went to, to draw the, the banner, the flyer, the handout, whatever it was for anything that was coming up. And I think is, you know, the big comics explosion in the nineties with image comics, you know, someone would say, Hey Bernie, can you draw the Punisher for me? You know, and they'd give me a few dollars and, you know, which of course I just like, turn right around to buy Punisher comics with John Romita Jr. Um, of course. Especially when you have bullet holes in the cover. Why can't you? You have to buy it, you know? Um, <laughs> and, yeah, I was just always that kid, uh, you know, and at the time, uh, my folks would take me to church all the time. So whenever there were projects, events, uh, programs, you know, I would eventually get grabbed by the arm and say, Bernie, you're going to paint this banner and we're going to do this bake sale and you're going to do the designs for each of the tables. And, and those were, you know, for better or for worse, that was the more the most formalized experience I would have outside of then just drawing on my own at home where okay. I would occasionally pick up a comic book at, you know, most of the time it was like grocery stores, pharmacies, uh, Walgreens, mm -hmm. and, you know, just try to replicate what I was seeing in some of those books, but, you know, more for myself, just not, not for a, not for an art class project or, or for a youth center thing. It was always just to entertain myself and keep myself busy. Okay. Did you go to college? I did, yeah. Okay. So, what, did you, so, what did you what did you study for college? Uh, well, th this is a fun story. So <laughs> I went to uh, uh, Western Illinois University, okay. which is probably I'd like to think as an alma mater, I'm 100 percent biased, but probably <laughs> one of the preeminent schools for law enforcement in the United States. Oh. And I was hard set on becoming a cop or something in in the world of law enforcement, and I didn't know what that was. So I completed uh, my bachelor's there and. The, the, towards the end, I thought, you know, this is really interesting. This is definitely a career that I want to pursue. I just don't know what I want to do. So I'd taken the Chicago police officer's exam and I passed that. And then I thought, well, maybe I want to make a bigger difference. So I'll go federal. So I had done an internship with the ATF, uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. Um, uh, fun stories there that have nothing to do with comics. But it, it, I think it just those those experiences just reinforced that I probably wasn't built for the real world version of law enforcement. Um, there are just some realities that if you're in a classroom and you have all the best of intentions to make a difference, that, that was my mindset. Um, but then seeing what the real world looked like, I'm like, talk about shades of gray. Uh, it was sure. very, very different, a rude awakening for me. Um, and just seeing that, I thought, you know what, I, I'm going to go back to some of the classes that I really enjoyed. And those were communication classes, you know, where we talked about marketing, um, public speaking, mm -hmm. you know, th things more more akin to like PR and stuff like that. Like, well, I'm just going to completely just change my career from working with like the Illinois Violent Crimes Bureau, where we're like doing like gang research and like just completely <laughs> nothing to do with public speaking. And then decided to get my master's in communication and think, okay. you know, and I'm just going to do completely different from law enforcement, try something else. Um, yeah. So both at Western, but that's nothing to do with art. But at the same time, 
drawing the whole time, buying comics, um, you know, just on the side, just kind of like experimenting with sketchbooks here and there, mm -hmm. just to kind of see, you know, just keep my art, art chops going. Sure. Understood. Yeah. And what did you do when you get out of school? Uh, right after school, uh, talk about like, this is the boring part of the interview. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I worked as a claims adjuster for a very large uh, insurance company uh, dealing with fatalities. So there are some very large uh, mail and package carriers in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and they have insurance. Sure. And I was working on a team where if one of the employees for those carriers would do something incredibly terrible, I mean, talking oh, no. like, like, you know, like you're drinking on the job and you take a van, a truck, a plane yeah. for these, this company and you kill other people. Oh dear. Uh, I know it gets a very serious interview, so I'm sorry for anyone <laughs> that was tuning into comics. Wow. But, um, and I would then have to work with a team to kind of figure out, okay, so, you know, what level of fault is the company at, if any? And if so, how to, how do we make this right? You know, how do we defend ourselves? So I was very much on the side of the company trying to protect them. Mm -hmm. And that again, exposed me to a whole new level of, you know, working with people and, and trying to negotiate and arbitration and uh, the law enforcement background came in, but the mm -hmm. communication background was that much more important because it was really predominantly talking to people and trying mm -hmm. to figure out how do we work through or around this incredibly terrible, you know, devastating event and try to get to a place where we, we can do, we can make some progress, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, realizing that that probably wasn't the world that I was going to live in forever. Um, but, you know, it afforded me literally the ability to kind of like start my life as an adult, you know, be able sure. to pay, move out of my parents' home, pay for rent, mm -hmm. um, you know, have a car, uh, have both Showtime and HBO, you know, <laughs> those, those little things that you dream of as a kid and you're like, all right, well, okay, now I can do this stuff. How do I do that? Well, it was through that, through that career, you know, and that just opened further doors into private investigation that brought in some of my law enforcement background. Again, nothing to do with comics or art school, but uh, yep. definitely paid a lot of bills. Sure. Well, we all have to do that, right? You're not doing comics full time. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So uh, for the last almost decade now I've been strictly in marketing okay so definitely if there's two parts of my life um, and I'm in my mid 40s now like the first yeah. half was very much the I want to be a cop or something like a cop and then the second half uh, you know uh, uh, there's a good Alex Toth Toth quote as we were talking <laughs> over here like I figured out uh, no I have to turn around and look at it um, I spent the first half of my career learning what to put in my work and the second half learning what to leave out yes. so I feel like that's very much uh, symbolic of my career. First half, I like I, I know what I want to do, and the second half has been realizing. Wait, I think I know what I love to do. Yep. I'm gonna just yep. focus on that. Yep. No, I'm in exactly the same way. I've been doing uh, interactive design for 25 plus years now. Um, all that time dabbling in comics and still loving comics, but mm -hmm. you know, you get. Like you said, you got to have a career. You have to do adult things. You have to pay bills. Sure. Uh, eventually, you know, I had a wife, I had kids uh, and um, and a house and a mortgage and all that comes with it. So um, and I think there's there's a that there's the movie, The Rookie, talk about quoting from Alex Toth to Dennis Quaid. It's, like, <laughs> like, it's OK to do what you want to do until you can do what you were meant to do. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that there is a, a divorce between the idea that, you know, this isn't the NFL where you have to hone your skill set, your body, your mindset to a point where you are part of this very small group of people who can do this very exceptional thing and get paid for it. Um, you can make comics and have a day job and right. have a family right. and be able to, I don't know, be a micro brewer and do whatever else you want to do and still do comics. Uh, mm -hmm. That That is the, the joy of comics is that you can do it at any time. But it, it, it does also, you know, for some people, allow them to have the livelihood out of it. But yeah, right. you, can, you can do both. That's where you can enjoy having a day job and a family and do this stuff and, and comics at the same time. That's that's what's so good because it's that accessible. Yep. Um, it, it just makes it easier to have conversations with people like you where, mm -hmm. you know, it's like we can have these parallels in our lives, like like the real world. <laughs> right. And at the same time, have bookshelves filled with stuff like this that we also have, you know, in common. 
That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's nice in that kind of like you were saying, you can participate in it as much or as little or at any level that you want to really, mm-hmm. if, if you've got the skills and the, and the perseverance, right. Um, mm-hmm. You could try to, you know, get that job at Marvel drawn Spider-Man, or you could just, you know, do a webcomic once a week um, exactly. for, for a couple of years and, and then just have fun with that. And mm-hmm. I think that's some, something that everybody, I've talked a little bit about this on the show before you have to kind of figure out what you want out of it. I'm coming to a point where I'm finally going to have some time dedicated to drawing and writing all the time. And I'm a little afraid of that because for years I've had an excuse where like, oh, you know, I'm not as good as I want to be, but that's because I haven't had enough time to practice. Um, Mm -hmm. So what happens when you can actually get all that time? You might find out I'm not built for this or Mm -hmm. I don't have the skills for this. I can do A and B, but I can't Mm -hmm. do C and D or I don't have the the draw i've talked to a lot of artists like yourself people who have been in animation comics film and they all say if you're not doing it all the time and you're not Mm -hmm. out there pushing Mm -hmm. talking to people getting feedback like you're not going to get to the upper echelons and i'm not not sure i want to be there Mm -hmm. but we'll we'll figure that out i mean you never know yeah you're doing midnight mystery right now but someone might come along and say oh wow we want to do a hardcover version of all five volumes and we want to do your next project and that could be, and I'm just making this up. It could be Double Day oh, books. Sure. It could be Disney books. It could be. I thought you were making an offer. I'm like, well. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> right, I mean, if, I, if, if I were independently <laughs> wealthy, we'd be having a different conversation. Um, but um, yeah, I, I love that about comics. I mean, it, it's kind of like having a garage band, right? Yep. Which is mm-hmm. you can just do it for fun, but then you can also kind of push it and see where it goes. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where there's a, a guy on Twitter. His name is Jack Butcher. And I, I there's. There's a lot of like marketing management principles that that surround like my life. So I, I kind of end up regurgitating some of that. And I think it's probably missing from the world of comics because we look at it from, I, I go back to like the Kevin Smith, one of his like Kevin Smith specials where he talks about meeting Tim Burton. And he's mm-hmm. like, I remember the first time I met Tim Burton, he was an artist. And just like, you know, the, the, the hand motions he's making to make it seem like an artiste, right? Like there's something very fragile and precious about the artwork and and the person and i think that there's a way where you know especially coming from a world of design coming from you know the from marketing there there are these very basic prince business principles that i think uh i'll, I'll speak for myself we see missing in the world of comics probably not that different from the world of music mm-hmm. where you know you have this entire machine where you know thinking more like probably you know i think we're about the same age so we remember cds let alone cassettes uh, <laughs> right. but you anyway you've, you've always heard kind of like an anecdote where madonna or michael jackson would sell a cd and maybe out of a 20 dollars cd uh 20 dollars and they would see a dollar or so and that was like upper echelon musicians mm-hmm. who are parts are ingrained into pop culture so what chance does an up-and-coming musician have to make a dollar let alone maybe 10 cents of that but yet you have this other group of artists that have decided to kind of circumvent the machine and found a way to just burn a bunch of CDs on their buddy's computer, the buddy with the best computer, right? Okay. And then go to go literally get a milk crate, fill it in, go to the back back alley of like a, of a place, play and just sell them for five bucks and keep all five dollars. There's something very punk rock about that, but I think there's something that um, like that's comics in the same way that dc or marvel is comics like they're they're both creating the same thing it's just in a different way it's like both things are music one just happens to be played on the radio and one person is hustling to sell a few copies in a back alley that's right but there's something very pure about you know about that idea of the punk rock and that's why i've always really appreciated the self-publishing idea because it is uh, kind of circling back to the Jake Butcher thing. So he's this guy who takes very basic principles and tries to visualize them in very simple ways. And there's uh, this really good um, uh, infograph he has about three types of people, the protagonist, uh, the iterator, and the perfectionist. And you see like these lines, and for the protagonist, there is no line because they just haven't gotten around to working on it, right? Mm-hmm. You, the perfectionist and the line is literally like, you know, this small. It's it's very small because they're so hyper-focused on making the perfect thing. So mm-hmm. try to translate the thing in their head to the page, whatever that is, music, a novel, a comic, you know, whatever. And then you have the iterator. 
and the iterator does this fail success fail success but you notice that it starts going up because with that failing fast mentality you start getting into this place where you start creating something that maybe not only is a part of you but is also responding to the marketplace right sure. the, the person that says hey i'm going to record a bunch of songs and somebody says well i like songs three four and five well maybe i'll just create a single that has songs three four and five and i'll be able to sell that faster or mm -hmm. i'll make this anthology with the stories that people like to the most from my web comics mm -hmm. and then at least I'll have a fighting chance of being able to sell that and get a customer base. Um, again, none of this stuff necessarily may be fun for people, but it, <laughs> these are also realities in, in the comics yes, world. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And it goes back to what you were saying. It's like you got to it's not just the creation of the comics, right? It's all it's there's the intangible parts um, with which is doing this, you know, getting out and and um, and marketing your piece. Um, it's you've got a website, you know, you've got a web presence on social media, you do a whole bunch of things to get people to look at your stuff, right. And that's not necessarily the fun or sexy stuff. Sure. Um, but if you want to keep making this stuff, um, I mean, again, it comes back to what you want out of it. If you just want to make cool stuff and keep it in a drawer and know that you made it awesome. That's totally fine. If that's your goal. Um, but if you want to make something more out of it, there's mm -hmm. there you gotta you gotta start hoofing it and uh, and getting the word out, um, going to shows even if you don't have a booth, but going around shows, handing out pamphlets or or um, uh, you know postcards or what have you. Um, but yeah, there's a there's a lot of legwork, and it Absolutely. seems like seems like you've been um, doing a lot of legwork. So you 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 write, draw, and color the comics. I know that you have a a, a letterer at least yes. on the on on these version on the the last three volumes, right? That's right. Yeah. Wes um, Loker. That's right. That's right. Um, he does a nice job. And of course you do a nice job, but I don't have to tell oh, you that. I've, I've already, I've already kissed your ass enough on this. Haven't I? <laughs> um, did you like, how long have you been working on these? Like there's, you've put out a ton of product in like a three month span mm -hmm. is you can't possibly have just put this together in the last no, year. That, that's, I think it's a, uh, you know, that's the three months is the byproduct of like almost like a decade and a half of work. Oh really? So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, so I graduated grad school, I think it was like 2004, 2003, somewhere around there. Okay. Um, and, you know, while kind of just establishing myself as an adult, right, um, drawing here and there, I started realizing that, uh, well, well, to be fair, that's when I discovered uh, like indie comics, Blankets, Scott McCloud, sure. and started to see this other line that was very different from the Jim Lee, Liefeld, 90s boom line that I love, but mm -hmm. there that there was this other thing and that this other world of comics not only was like in comic shops, but they were also in Barnes and Nobles and Walden books, but mm -hmm. that they were also seemed to be a little bit more personal and there were a lot less capes in the story. <laughs> and that, that just blew my mind. So I'm like, yeah. here I am drawing these things. But at the same time, like I love Sergio Leone movies and I love Akira Kurosawa. Mm -hmm. Could there be a comic book about uh, this lone samurai? Like, oh, that, that, I, that could kind of work. And what if you know he happened to run into like a gunslinger in you know in the Clint Eastwood mold? Oh, I, I could tell that story. Like I, I, I like that, but that's not a comic book. Wait, is it? And <laughs> like that's where my my mind was starting to work to start figuring out like what story did I want to tell? Mm -hmm. Because I, I I felt like I'm like I think I can do this, and that, that's in a way how I kind of got to Midnight Mystery because I started realizing that. I was never a big sketchbook person. I'm very functional in my artwork. If mm -hmm. I'm going to sketch something, and I, I wouldn't even call it sketches, but it's towards a, it's towards an end goal. It's okay. because I know I have a, a project in my mind. And at the time, I'm like, all right, well, I don't. I, I have actually some like samurai like sketches or, or panels that I kind of worked to get the feel of what that would look like. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know if I wanted to do that. So I'm like, well, I know I I do want to tell this kind of like. Jean Leclerc style World War II story, you know, with a little bit of uh, like uh, Guns of Navarone kind of mm -hmm. thrown in, and, you know, this just kind of like, I don't know, this sort of like pulpy 60s, 70s, you know, where Eagles have dared kind of style, sure. uh, you know, just a lone guy kind of coming in, trying to get into this impenetrable fortress. And there's some spy craft involved. I'm like, okay, that, that'd be kind of a cool story to tell. And then I'll do like a dog fight with spitfires and that'll be neat. And so I started working on that and 
it, it, it eventually like I, I worked on it for quite a while maybe like two or three years so we're talking still about mid to late 2000s okay and just had this ton of work that it was really more experimenting with how i could tell the story um i was discovering like pencil brush pens at the time so starting to realize that i did not have to use um, microns like i did in like mm -hmm. all my architecture classes um in, in high school yeah. and when you see you know there was no youtube at the time so it's literally going to a convention and you know just interrogating someone in artist alley <laughs> where'd you get that pen how'd you get it how are you using it can you use it right now <laughs> just like it's just like going through that process of uh of trying to discover like you know how the how the sausage is made and you're right. just asking other artists and then you know things like pencil jack and deviant art were very nascent i mean they were not what they what the, i don't know that pencil jack exists but uh, even it does like actually Deviant, it does okay yeah good. yeah that makes my heart feel good because uh, <laughs> there were a lot of lessons that i learned through artists posting and in comments providing a little bit of just uh, the process how did mm -hmm. this happen how did they make this work and then trying to replicate some of that and around that time uh, is when i discovered darwin cook mm -hmm. and that's when i started to kind of put these things together here's this guy who has very solid influences in Toth and Jack Kirby and animation. And, and again, I, I did not know who those guys were. I just knew that it, it's kind of like watching uh, a John Woo movie. And if you reverse engineer it, you realize a hard target, which is not his best example, <laughs> yeah. um, is his way to get to America. But you have to go back to the killer hard boiled. But if you look at those movies, you have to go back to like Sam Peckinpah right. and bring me the head of our Fredo Garcia and the Wild Bunch. Yep. And then you go back even further to, um, oh my God, uh, the guy, uh, John Wayne, the searchers. Yep. And you keep going further back and you realize that these guys are all this kind of like this, there's this timeline of influences. Mm -hmm. And if you can kind of see this like overhead view, you're like, I know how John Wu got here and it's the byproduct of him watching all these movies and kind of piecing this all together. That's mm -hmm. how I felt when I found Darwin Cook. Is sure. I thought, not only is he bringing in his animation because there is an efficiency to what he's doing, yep. but he's created these rules for himself. And this was New, uh, New Frontier, this three panel grid in a way. And he, he changed the rules sometimes, but for the most part, that started to give me a, a, a sandbox to play in. Sure. Like, Here's this guy who, who has unbelievable talent and yet he's giving himself these rules because this is this is him saying, at least in my mind, I'm like, you have to find the perfect shot. And I only have three panels on a page. So I have to think that much harder where I want the camera to be. So if I need two people interacting, I don't get to, and, and for someone else, they might say, well, Bernie, that's just limiting. I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, I can't cheat. I need to find that perfect shot where the person's foreground or background, mm -hmm. where they can talk, I can set the mood and allow for word balloons and be very efficient in my storytelling. Yep. So I actually can draw more panels that much faster because I can go through and just draw three panels in a page. Right. That's what I was learning at the time and realizing that this World War II story, you know, yeah, I want to draw a dog fight. Well, okay, well, let me figure out how I would storyboard this in maybe 12 panels. And now that ends up becoming a scene and seeing how Darwin Cook was successfully doing that in New Frontier, how the Batman animated series was, was able to tell these very complex stories also very efficiently in mm -hmm. 22 minutes with just enough dialogue to move the story along. You provide a lot of characterization and mood. And those were a lot of the things that kind of were, were, were hardcore informing me at the time and very much influences that I wear on my sleeve now. Sure. Yeah. So what's interesting about that is, yeah, you talk about economy of storytelling, which I think is something that I'm a big fan of. Like I, I love um, Jeff Darrow and some of these other guys who put every little sure. <laughs> detail that's in their head on the page. And I'm mm -hmm. not that kind of guy. I can't, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I get bored or if I just feel like I can't do it or, um, but I really like to keep it moving, right? Mm -hmm, so it's mm -hmm. just, what's, what needs to be on the page? What's the, the least I can put on the page to tell this story effectively? And I don't mean because I'm lazy. It's because, sure. it's because I appreciate guys like um, well, uh, Will Eisner or, or Darwin Cook or mm -hmm. Toth or um, 
uh, Wally Wood or a whole bunch of people who are like, they used to have to crank out pages and pages a day, particularly some of the older school guys, Kirby, mm -hmm. um, Buscema, like any of the old Ditko, any of the old school guys, right? They used mm -hmm. to crank out pages all the time just to right. pay, pay the rent. And so they would have to figure out, and there was the um, 22 panels um, mm -hmm. that always work, you know? Yep. Um, mm -hmm. but, there, but there was also, I think it was, um, was it a Wally Wood quote that was, um, don't draw what you can trace, don't trace what you can, um, or how did it go? Don't, <laughs> no. there was something where it was, it was basically like a, a, a um, it's like the Mark Grace quote for baseball. If you're not cheating, you're not trying. <laughs> if, you, if you have a morgue file with, with a spitfire, and, yeah. I, and I, this is like a perfect example of that. Like I remember going to a model store and buying a spitfire yeah. and just taking pictures of it from different angles. Absolutely. Printing them out and just being like, okay, well, I'm just going to take this on my, my light board. Yeah. And like, here we go. Like, and, and the brushwork is going to bring the personality. It's going to bring the the art to it so it's right. not just a straight up reproduction but i could do that or painstakingly try to recreate this thing right. when in the same period of time i could finish a whole page instead of a whole panel mm -hmm. yeah i mean i went to school for illustration so um, um reference is everything and there's no such thing as copying from real life that's called reference. Sure, there, yeah. <laughs> Copying is taking somebody else's work and doing it yes, identical. Sure. That's called plagiarism. Mm -hmm. um, but there's <laughs> using the world around you, whether it's for anatomy or for a plane or for what have you, is not a problem. Like I bought these little tiny figures. They're from Japan and I can't read Japanese, so I don't know what the title is, but they're those little mm -hmm. plastic, you know, things that you can you can pose. And then I okay. can take I can take my camera and I can uh, I get right up close to it. And I yes. can get a really dramatic scene yeah. without having to use a 3D software, a piece of 3D sure. software that I don't know how to use. Um, but and it's or not... have one of your kids pose for you. Exactly, which I which I have done. Um, there you go. <laughs> I've also also done me posing, but mm -hmm. I don't exactly look like Superman um, or Batman um, or even uh, some of our less fit heroes, to be to be, <laughs> to be honest. So I mean, I, I can get a basic pose from myself, but I can't sure. get. I can't yeah. really get, and you also can't get the dynamicism that you can get from, you know, looking at a pose long term and then just really abstracting it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's one of the nice things that I love about Bruce Tim and Darwin Cook is the abstraction. Like they use the simple lines, and that comes from it being animation and it yeah. having to be simple to reproduce, um, which is how I think of comics. I want it to be simple to reproduce, um, just because I want to tell a complex story and I want to keep it moving. Uh, and I don't have, I'm not one of these, I'm not Jim Lee, I'm not Liefeld, I'm not anybody who's got a lot of detail and ink work. Um, it's just not how I'm, how I'm going to do things. Um, so which well, is, I think a lot of that, like you said, the animation piece, Yeah. there, there is a, and you know, for anyone who's watching this, I think there's a way where, you know, not to put words in your mouth, Patrick, but I think there's a way where like, if it's someone like like we have an appreciation for Jeff Darrow and I do too. I mean, yeah. Rusty Big Boy, like that's it's it's fantastic. Good, great stuff. Yeah. Um, and when I think about his uh, hard boiled, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like it's it's amazing to look at as this artifact that to me represents like all this work. You know, yeah. like um, uh, oh, what is it? Oh man, his samurai book that he did. I want to say with Dark Horse, uh, oh, Shell and Cowboy, Cowboy, Shell and Cowboy. Cowboy. Yeah. Like you see the work that he did on that and the time frame in between the the publication of each issue, uh, it makes sense. It's mm -hmm. a, it absolutely makes sense for for what it is. But then I think there's also a way where, at least again in my discovery of people like Darwin Cook and then going into like Toth and you know even like pulp artists like Robert Parker, um, like you started seeing that there was a sense of urgency mm -hmm. in the fact that because of the deadlines because there right. was this idea behind it and that's something that just for my own work ethic my, my own personality that was attractive to me right in the way that you know that um i think about like it, like i want an earnest artist and you know in jeff darrow you're getting that yep. like he there everything is on the page yep but when I look at art, at least in the way that I produce it, and this may be a complete like sacrilege for someone watching this, I'm like, <laughs> I want artwork, at least for, in the, on the production side for me, to feel like a knee surgeon. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want the knee surgeon to come in and tell me 
he doesn't feel like doing knee surgery that day. <laughs> like, I'm just not in the mood. Like, I just want him to do the thing. Um, right. And this comes from like <laughs> Seth Godin, who's like a really big marketer. Oh, yeah, sure. It, it, like where he talked about like there's an er earnestness that comes with art and giving something of yourself. And I think mm -hmm. in comic books, there's very much a lot of that. And this may seem like a lot of like very highfalutin, I, you know, I, <laughs> ways of talking about comics. But I, I think the, the proof is, you know, all you have to do is give your niece or nephew or a younger kid, give them this comic book, not this one specifically, this is a Qbert Ragman book, <laughs> but <laughs> give them this and just sit down and watch how they process it mm -hmm. and how quickly they turn the pages. Mm -hmm. And you start realizing that even someone as great as Qbert, who may have taken a day or so, that was a day of his life to make the page, right? The pencils, maybe the inks, assuming he inked himself. Um, but for your nephew or, or for your kid, like it literally was, a 30, 40 second page turn. Right. And there's something very, uh, I, I don't want to say like distressing about that, but there's something very, to me, that's, just, I don't know, there's something very, I don't know, just makes it that much more realistic to say, if that's how quickly someone is going to process this page, I should probably be realistic in the time I should spend to create this. Right. And if I take that animation mentality and look at this as production artwork, where I can reuse backgrounds where I've drawn a hand really well before on a page mm -hmm. and like, okay, well, let me just pull that one out, light box it again, or now using digital tools like Procreate, well, let me just go back to that and just like take out that ink work for the hand, copy it, and now I don't have to go through and do this and take pictures and, you know, figure it out. I'm like, it's mm -hmm. done. Right. Let me move on to the next thing because I don't think there are that many people that would be sitting there critiquing and saying, Bernie, use the same background mm -hmm. on page 32 as you did in the previous volume on page 108. <laughs> and I, I would say, that's fair. I'm glad that eagle-eyed viewers may have seen that. <laughs> but because of that, I got to spend an evening with my wife. So that's right. I'm, I'm okay with my choices. Um, <laughs> totally. So, totally. Yeah. There was, um, I, I don't think, mo like you said, most people don't really stare. So if there is, like you got a nine panel grid, right? And people are talking or there's a hand in one and it's identical hand in the fifth one. Sure. You and I might take the, the I at least, I look real closely <laughs> and see it might have been the same pencils, but did they at least ink it differently? Mm -hmm. Just, and if they didn't, I'm like, oh, okay. This artist mm -hmm. who I respect mm -hmm. did just for economy of time and mm -hmm. their, own, their own value of their own, own time, just copied and pasted. It still tells a story. You're yes. going to move right past it. It doesn't really mm -hmm. matter. Most people are not doing what I'm doing with a magnifying glass. I'm not literally, but you know, no, sure. <laughs> but metaphorically looking with a magnifying glass. Yes. Um, and it's, it, I think it, now it would just be this. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and years ago, I had a conversation with Keith Giffen, um, who's, he's primarily an artist, or I'm sorry, primarily a writer these days, but has been an artist in the past. And if you look at his style, it's very simple and very flat. He uses a lot of blacks on the page. He doesn't mm -hmm. use um, a lot of shading. He doesn't do a lot of cross hatching when he inks himself. Um, and he said to me, he's like, look, it should take you as long as it takes to be on the toilet to read a comic book. <laughs> um, he's like, so why are you spending all your time putting all this energy into it? Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, he wasn't disparaging other people. He meant for himself. No, sure. yeah. He's talking mm -hmm. about himself. Um, mm -hmm. Like he has worked for DC and for Marvel for years and worked with a lot of artists who are more meticulous and do love the process of getting all the detail in. And I totally appreciate that. I consider those like, you know, um, uh, something to aspire to, but not necessarily, you know, my bag. And it sounds like it's you're not, not your bag either. Same, yeah. And I think that's the, the ultimate... I mean, maybe that's the ultimate critique, right? Where yeah. we appreciate both styles. Sure. Um, the end goal is is what we both look at, though. Like, you know, I think about like a Keith Giffen Lobo comic for that, you know, I'm like, yeah, I remember like, like good composition, but also like a lot of energy, probably energy that, that was come across because there was a certain inertia in his production where he was mm -hmm. constantly moving, trying to create something. Mm -hmm. Like you said, maybe not with the toilet in mind, but <laughs> nonetheless, <laughs> that idea that, the person is going to digest this for a certain period of time so i don't have to make something that precious mm -hmm. um but at the same time realizing that when someone does take the time to make something 
I think the the artist world kind of looks at it in awe because we appreciate the journey that it took to create that thing. Uh, it's just I'm thinking like Paul Pope, where he uses right. a very economical but very dynamic brush line in his work. And when I see it, I see the strokes, I see the composition. I think, well, that's not that hard. And like I think I could reproduce something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Or even a uh, uh, Craig Thompson in Blankets, where there's sure. also this very interesting, like lively brushwork to it. But maybe the brushwork is not the thing; it's the story. It's him putting himself and his experiences, his journey into that. That was the hard work. So right. it's not the page that necessarily took a long time to make. It's just the 10 years it took him to figure out how he was going to tell the story. That's right. Okay, so you're saying you do not accept human remains in your composting service? No, no, I'm just curious. Is it a, like a don't ask, don't tell put? Oh, I gotta go, I gotta go. <clears throat> hey, how'd you like that? The interview, I mean. I love hearing people's stories when they have a radical change to their career path, like Bernie's. Do you have a story like that? What is it? And how about your influences? Who do you look to for inspiration and how does it influence your work? Let me know down in the comments, won't you? If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up so other people like you can find it. And if you'd like to watch more of my videos, take a look at the ones listed here. I've got more conversations with other artists you might like, or maybe check out some advice based on my own personal experience. And as always, remember this. You don't suck, you just think you do. And you're wrong. Keep drawing, writing, welding, crocheting, or whatever, suckers. Peace!